Hi, my name is Monty Johnson and I teach philosophy at the University of California, San Diego. And this is the second of six lectures on Lucretius. This one on the variety, motion, and recombination of atoms and void, according to Lucretius in De Rerum Natura, Book 2. And I'm using the translation of Cyril Bailey, which is available in the public domain through the Internet Archive. Now, to remind you of where we are in the overall structure of the poem, Lucretius in Book 1 had established the existence of atoms and void space in an infinite cosmos, an infinite plurality of worlds or cosmoi within the universe. In this book, he discusses how those atoms move around in the void and move in such ways as to combine and form complexes of compounds that create the visible and sensible bodies that we see all around us. So we are still operating at the microscopic level of discussing atoms and void, not just their existence now, but how they uh, move. And these microscopic principles Lucretius continues to infer from macroscopic phenomena, and he makes other sorts of arguments to convince you about how they move and what the variety of their uh, causes of their motion are. And so he continues to discuss the physical assumptions of the atomistic uh, theory. And in this chapter, we move from the stage of of birth and the basic conditions of things onto their growth and nurturing, how they first um, grow into what uh, they are. Now, uh, give an outline of the elements of book two. The proem here is especially important and famous. Lucretius points out how Observing the less fortunate from a safe position causes us psychological tranquility, and he also mentions the ease of providing for the needs of the body, and even pleasure, and avoiding pain and distress. And he discusses the relative difficulty and vanity of pursuing riches and power, and he gives an exhortation to the study of philosophy as the only reliable means to tranquility. Of course, the bulk of the book consists of the arguments about the motion, speed, and direction of the atoms in the void, but he also discusses the variety of atomic uh, shapes, the infinitude of atoms of each shape, how the recombination of atoms and alternating processes of generation and destruction correspond. And he also argues that the atoms themselves are devoid of any um, sensory qualities, although their various shapes gives, give rise to the variety of sensations that we experience. And then in the finale, he discusses the infinite plurality of worlds, which corresponds to the finale in book one, which proved the infinite quantity of atoms in the infinite void space of the cosmos. But here, instead of focusing on the birth and origin of everything, we end up discussing the inevitable destruction and decay of our world. But we do discuss not just the infinite plurality of atoms, but their combination into an infinite um, set of worlds, including worlds habited by other that is, extraterrestrial life forms and even extraterrestrial intelligences. Now, again, the poem or introduction to book uh, two is probably the most famous of the whole book, and Lucretius discusses the calming effect of essentially looking down on or thinking about people who are more misfortunate than you, and the poetic examples are very literal, sitting on a cliff and looking at um, ships in a storm, struggling on turbulent seas, or overlooking a land battle, or 
looking down from a skyscraper at people rushing about doing business appointments. Um, it is creates a calm, tranquil effect when one doesn't have to be concerned with that business, or one isn't fighting in that battle, or one isn't at risk of sinking in that sea. And this isn't because we enjoy, he's very careful to point out, this isn't because we take pleasure or joy in other people's distress, but because it is sweet to perceive when you are free of misfortune. And this is essentially the end um, and purpose of life, according to Epicureans, is to be able to have a calm, tranquil disposition relative to everything because you're not suffering from it. So you can concentrate on the suffering uh, that other people are experiencing, hopefully uh, then taking steps to alleviate it. Now, the basic psychological insight here is actually attributable to a much earlier philosopher, Democritus, who earlier recommended turning your focus specifically away from those who are more fortunate than you. Because when you focus on people that are richer or more beautiful or more successful than you, then that causes painful emotions like envy, jealousy, and generally feelings of relative deprivation. Uh, but when you turn away from concentrating on those people and think about people who are uh, poorer and uglier and more unhealthy and unfortunate than you, then you replace those other kinds of feelings with feelings of pity and mercy. And ultimately, Democritus argues feelings of solidarity uh, towards them. And uh, Lucretius uh, takes this idea and asserts that riches and nobility and power and glory, you know, conventional goods pursued by people all around him, uh, don't afford the body or the mind any pleasure or tranquility or relief from pain. And he contrasts how difficult the pursuit of such things is with how easy it is to free the mind from care and fear and to provide pleasure for the body. And he here invokes again the overall slogan of the work, which we already saw in book one. This terror then, this darkness of the mind, must needs be scattered not by the rays of the sun and the gleaming shafts of day, but by the outer view and the inner law of nature. And this, the earlier context in which this was raised had to do with the fear of death, and the fear of death must be dispelled uh, by these Epicurean insights. And here it's um, getting rid of the negative emotions that are due to excessive desires that he's focusing on. But the same, the same um, emotional uh, distress that disturbs and robs us of the happiness and tranquility that we're seeking uh, in life, uh, the solution is the same, and that is um, comprehending the Epicurean philosophy. Now, this book also contains an excellent uh, model and way of thinking about uh, atomistic physics and the unforgettable image of dust motes in sunlight or sunbeams. It's a familiar phenomenon. As Lucretia says, look closely whenever rays are let in and pour the sun's light through the dark places and houses, for you will see many tiny bodies mingle in many ways all through the empty space right in the light of the rays. Now, first of all, this phenomenon provides direct evidence that there are minute invisible bodies something that we demonstrated already in book one, but here further evidence is invoked to support that proposition. And Lucretius says that if there are minute invisible bodies moving in all directions in this sunbeam, then they, they, the visible ones must be uh, colliding with invisible ones. We don't see what is uh, moving them, so they must be smaller than we can see, thus minute um, invisible bodies again 
exist. Uh, but this image of dust motes and sunlight is also just a model for the incessant motion and collision and recombination of material bodies in void space. And essentially this is the deep view of the entire universe according to this uh, philosophy that um, it's all these kind of material bodies moving chaotically through an infinite void space whose collisions uh, ultimately give rise to and collide with and affect the motions of the bodies that are visible to us. Now, I just point out, Lucretius doesn't say this, but each mode of dust is actually very large relative to the atoms. He would certainly agree with that, but the bewildering amount of atoms, something like 500 quadrillion atoms in a single uh, dust mote, uh, shows us how uh, tiny and, of course, invisible uh, those atoms, in fact, are. Now, thus, they, in order for such minute entities to build up to uh, entities that are visible to us, that are perceptible to us, that connect with our senses at a level that we can become aware of, they must be built up over several levels. And in fact, these are levels of complexity. So the atoms have to recombine to form larger bodies. We might say now something like uh, molecules, combinations of atoms to uh, form molecules, and then, of course, molecules um, combining to form larger and larger uh, bodies until we ultimately get to tissues, and then we get to whole organs and recombin recombining organs till we get to the level of the organism. Um, these uh, recombinations to form larger uh, bodies happen at the micro level of the atoms themselves until they form molecules and enough molecules, as it were, um, come together until they've compounded to reach visible bodies that we can see. As Lucretia says, from the first beginnings of things, for the first beginnings of things move of themselves, then those bodies which are formed of a tiny union and are as it were, nearest to the powers of the first beginnings, are smitten and stirred by their unseen blows, and they in their turn rouse up bodies a little larger. And so the movement passes upwards from the first beginnings, and little by little comes forth to our senses, so that those bodies move too, which we can descry in the sun's light. Yet it is not clearly seen by what blows they do it. So these uh, bodies that are visible to us, even the ones that are as small as a moat of dust, can be analyzed into their constituent atoms and void, and in fact into quadrillions of atoms and void. Now, Lucretius discusses the internal and external causes of the fact that the atoms are in motion. So far, we've only proven that there are atoms and that there are void on the basis of there being larger scale structures that we can see. But what are the causes of the atoms moving in the void? Because all atoms, he says, are always in motion. They wander through the void, he poetically puts it. And this is due to one of the following necessary causes. It could be due to their own weight or gravity, their heaviness, as he calls it. This causes them to move straight downwards in parallel lines through the void. So if something's heavy, as we can see, it moves straight downwards. So the atoms, since they must be heavy, of their own accord, move straight downwards. They also move, however, due to strong blows from other atoms, collision with other atoms, and these 
collisions cause them to bounce around and redound either at great distances when there is nothing impeding them but void and so this accounts for phenomena like air, light, or heat moving at great uh, distances. For example, think of the um, light and heat coming from the sun. Or they redound at smaller distances because they've become entangled with other bodies. Um, and this is what happens with solid objects like wood, rock, metal, or Diamond, very hard objects, must have very small interstitial distances and voids in which these redounding quadrillions of redounding atoms move. Now, um, since it has already been shown that the universe is not limited in extent, there can't actually be a bottom floor of the universe, so all of the atoms must ever fall through the void. Uh, due to their own weight, they're constantly following, falling through the void and constantly colliding, sending them in every possible direction, much, of course, like dust motes in a sunbeam. Next, uh, Lucretius discusses the velocity or the speed at which this atomic motion is occurring. All atoms he says, basically move through the void uh, at the same exact velocity, and this must be as quickly as possible. In fact, the velocity, says, must be faster than the speed of light, like the light uh, coming from the sun, because those light particles, since they're visible, must be larger than the atoms, in Lucretius's view, and Furthermore, they're moving through fields, like the atmosphere, the air or the water, that contain other bodies with which they must collide occasionally and thus be slowed down. Now, it's interesting here that Lucretius observes that light must travel at a finite speed. It remains to be seen whether um, anything can travel faster than light in some modern physical theories it, uh, nothing can travel faster uh, than light. But if you had the smallest possible object, so small, for example, that they had no mass and they were essentially moving through a void and were so small that through voids and were so small they couldn't collide with anything, then perhaps they could move faster. Now, the Atoms, however, in the theory, are the smallest possible objects, and so when moving through the void, they encounter no resistance whatsoever. So they must all travel at an equal and constant speed in this circumstance. Nothing to slow them down, and they're small, so they move as fast uh, as possible. Now, after that argument, we next have a digressive um, attack on anthropocentrism, an attack on the theory that the purpose of all of nature and the universe is to benefit human beings. Um, now this seems to follow an actual gap in the text, which suggests that either our text has been mutilated in the form we've received it since, since it was put into the form that Lucretius wrote it, or that Lucretius did not complete the poem, and this section was left imperfect. Um, but anyway, we suddenly are in a discussion of the fact that um, those people are wrong who argue that the gods have designed the world and designed its seasons and the motions and changes that happen in it all for the benefit of human beings. Now, we can label such a view anthropocentric, because in such a view, human beings are the center of the cosmos and the purpose of all creation, as they are in, for example, Plato's Timaeus. And this is typically a feature of intelligent design creationist accounts of nature. Some god or demiurge or craftsman designs the whole world for the purpose of 
uh, human beings. And Lucretius attributes such a view to an ignorance of matter and how uh, materialist theories can better explain how the cosmos comes to be without depending on these supernatural um, entities and also uh, can explain not only why some things do appear suitable for human beings but why so many things don't and the universe seems to so badly be set up for human beings. Now the main argument here then is that the nature of the world is by no means made by divine grace for us. There are too many uh, flaws but Lucretius essentially puts off the discussion of what those flaws are. Of course, they come much sooner than the end of Book 6 in these descriptions of the destructibility, decay, and inevitable destruction of our entire world, and the vivid descriptions in Book 6, which end with the plague and its horrible effects upon the Athenians. So the point is, there must not be a god in this cosmos because it's not sustaining it, or at least not sustaining it for the sake of human beings, because look at what actually uh, happens in it and how inconvenient it is for human beings. Now, returning to the discussion of the causes of atomic motions, recall that the atoms or first bodies are carried downward straight through the void by their own weight. Now, Lucretius asserts that at certain times, undetermined times and undetermined places, they actually push a little off this path, yet only so much as you could call a trend or just a slight deviation. That is, we say atoms occasionally swerve. At undetermined times and places, atoms swerve from their straight downward path. For if they always traveled at the exact same speed through the void in straight parallel lines, as they do as a result of their weight, as we argued earlier, then none of them would ever collide with each other. But if they never collided, because they could never catch up with each other since they're all moving at exactly the same speed and exactly in parallel lines, then none of them would ever become entangled, and then no compound bodies could have been generated. But it is apparent that compound bodies have been generated because there are visible and sensible objects in our environment. Thus, atoms must occasionally swerve from their straight downward direction. Now, once an atom is off course, it's free to collide and redound with other atoms and in fact cause a chain reaction of further collisions and redounding, which eventually cause entanglements large enough to form compounds that are visible to us. And the same process is ramified upwards on the scales of complexity until we reach entire planets and entire solar systems and entire galaxies and entire clusters of galaxies and superclusters in the entire um, universe. Now, it turns out then that there are in fact three causes of atomic motion, um, two of them necessary, internal necessity of weight or gravity, which causes them to move straight downwards, the external necessity when there are blows or collisions, those are, those are both kinds of necessary movement, and then this unnecessary movement. And so it's, it's hard to even consider it a cause, but there is this indeterminacy in the overall system that we call swerves. Now, one nice feature of this theory of swerves is it allows Lucretius to avoid a problem about the uh, determinism of all events within his cosmos. So in addition to using the swerve to explain the existence of visible bodies and worlds, 
a phenomena, phenomena that certainly do need explanation, this verb also allows Lucretius to address a threat to voluntary motion. Because if all motions in this universe were linked to previous motions in a continuous chain-like succession, then there would seem to be no possibility of free motion. And so in contemporary parlance, we'd say something like everything would be determined or predetermined by antecedent causes, by a chain of causes. But if the motion of atomic matter is not, in fact, predetermined by its antecedent causes, that is, its weight and blows, but there is occasionally an unnecessary cause, swerves, as we've just argued, then it would not be the case that everything is determined or predetermined. Sometimes there's just an atomic swerve. So therefore, determinism, the idea that there's a universal, unavoidable chain of necessary causes, is not actually a threat to voluntary motion, whether of animals like horses, Lucretius's main example in the passage, or of human action, which is clearly his main concern. Now, we can ask a lot of questions about this theory. Um, one pressing one is how often do the swerves happen? So, in theory, perhaps there was only just one swerve ever. In that case, there would have been a sufficient condition met for their being collisions and further entanglements, and assuming there is a large enough chain reaction, there would be uh, a overall cause of the formation of all worlds, would be that single uh, swerve. But Lucretius seems to refer to several swerves, um, so perhaps there's just one swerve every time a different world is formed, and swerves begin the process of world formation. Uh, but how often? How often does that happen? Um, and do they happen within worlds? And if so, are they rare or occasional within the same world? Perhaps they actually happen quite frequently, like every time a free or voluntary action is taken, or every time there's a voluntary motion, there must be a swerve of atoms happening in the mind, happening in the soul atoms. Uh, but I don't, I'm not going to venture an answer to this uh, question here, how often do swerves happen? Uh, but I will raise another troubling question for the theory, which is how a random swerve of atoms could possibly um, allow for or explain free voluntary motion. Uh, after all, we want and need voluntary motions of horses, for example, not to mention humans, not to be random motions. So I don't think that I'm only free when I just um, happen to not do something uh, because you know I was going to smoke a cigarette and then I just happened to decide not to because there was a swerve of an atom in my mind. I want to think that it's actually me doing it, that I'm responsible for it. But uh, swerves seem to be completely random. Again, they happen at no determinate time and no determinate place. And so the real importance of the theory, I think, is that it undermines the assumptions of a determinism that would be a threat to freedom and voluntary motion. Now, even though there's all of this motion and swerving and colliding going on on the level of the atoms and void and their compounds, according to Lucretius, the universe as a whole is in a kind of steady state, uh, despite appearing very chaotic. Um, when we uh, move out and look at the larger picture of the cosmos as a whole, it's fairly uniform, and it's pretty much always been like it is. Um, and that's because no matter ever gets added to it or subtracted from it. Recall the 
laws of conservation of matter, the first two propositions in book one. And so the distribution of matter in space is essentially um, uniform, although there is local variation and there is constant change going on. And this is more and more evident at a smaller scale that you look at dust motes in a sunbeam, but then there are quadrillions of atoms moving within each uh, dust mote. But when we zoom out to the global universe view, it all essentially seems um, almost static. And there are abundant physical analogies to things that appear to be at rest from a great distance, but when viewed much more closely, and definitely when viewed with things like microscopes, uh, look to consist of things that are greatly in motion and moving around. Now, the next topic that Lucretius discusses at great length, actually, is the variety of atomic shapes. So how many different shapes are there? Um, are there just a few, like most of them are spheres or cubes? Uh, or are there all kinds of different shapes, not just tetrahedrons, dodecahedrons, icosahedrons, but lots of other configurations of shapes and with features like uh, mountains and valleys and even hooks and eyelets. Now, Lucretia says the variety of atomic shapes is in fact very great, uh, for if the variety were small, there wouldn't be such a great variety of things. But as it is, if you look at any two things in nature and examine them closely enough, um, the same or uh, members of the same species, including animals, plants, shells, and so forth, uh, will appear different and will show important differences. And he makes a kind of uh, fractal-like point that, uh, again, things from a distance appear to be very similar, but the closer and closer you view them, the greater their variety seems to be. So there must be a great variety of atomic shapes to account for these difference, differences, even between members of the same species. And several other considerations lead to the same conclusion. There wouldn't be such a great variety of sensations for each sensory modality, but there are a great variety, of course, of tastes, sounds, odors, colors, hot and smooth, smooth and rough, hot and hard and soft sensations, pleasures and pains. All of those are so varied, there must be a basis for them in a great variety of atomic shapes. And um, keep in mind that according to the theory, all of these forms of sensation are ultimately forms of touch due to contact and collision of sensible objects with sensory organs, all of which completely consist of atoms and void. So there must be a great variety of shapes to account for this great variety of the different modes of senses, and then within each mode, the great variety of possible objects of sensation. So the variety of atomic shapes is responsible for all kinds of further differences, he points out, like hardness, liquidity, pungency, evanescence, uh, and so on. And then he has to work out a couple of cases where there are apparent contradictions, like things that seem liquid so that they ought to have one kind of atomic shape so that they can uh, move freely, but that are bitterer, and so must, uh, to some extent, be sharp and tear up the sense organs. Uh, these things, he argues, are due to the complexity of the recombinations of such a variety of atomic shapes. Recall the proposition that nothing is made up of just a single kind of atomic shape. Everything is made up of a great variety of atomic shapes. Nevertheless, the total variety of atomic shapes must be limited, he's careful to argue. That's because if 
the total number of shapes was unlimited or infinite, ever larges, larger sizes of atoms would apparently be necessary in order to accommodate the variations in shape. And in that case, there would actually become visible atoms at some point, and even gigantic atoms, atoms the size of whole worlds, because an infinite variety of shapes would require infinitely large atoms. But of course, no such large atoms are seen, so the number of atomic shapes must be limited, and thus the number of atomic sizes must be limited. Again, if the total number of shapes was infinite, there would be no limit to variation, he says, no boundaries of experience. We would see ever greater extremes of the qualities like hot and cold, pleasure and pain. But the boundaries of experience of hot and cold and pleasure and pain are strictly limited on both sides, so there must be a limited, although admittedly great, variety of atomic shapes. That being said, the number of atoms of any one shape must, of course, be infinite. We've already proven that there are an infinite number of atoms moving through an infinite void space and given proofs for that. Here he argues that the number of atoms of any one shape are infinite, or if the number were not infinite, then either the shapes themselves would have to be infinite or the total sum of matter would have to be finite. But again, A was just disproven that the um, shapes couldn't be infinite, or else you would have infinitely large atoms. And B was disproven earlier in book one when it was shown that there must be an infinite number of total atoms. Now, even a single natural kind, he said if there, even if there was a singular unique individual thing, you would still need an infinite fund of atoms in order for it to subsist. Otherwise, the finite number of its component atomic shapes would have become scattered in the infinite void and never reassembled in the fullness of time. But since um, natural kinds cohere and furthermore reproduce things of their own kind, there again um, must be an infinite uh, store or fund of them to continue to do so. And in his view, generation and destruction are always uh, balanced. So there's always new things being born and old things passing away, and the old things passing away provide the material for the new things to be born. And as he poetically puts it, the wails of the newborn baby forever mingle with the lamentations heard at uh, funerals. Now, no compound um, can consist of a single kind of element, even the ones that we commonly speak as if they do, earth, air, water, and fire. So earth isn't a single element, but actually contains in itself fire, water, air, and atoms of a great variety of shapes. Um, you know, many of them cubical, but many of them other shapes as well. And after saying this, Lucretius gives a digression into a kind of prayer to Mother Earth and how she's celebrated for giving birth and nurturing all. But then, as in Book One and the uh, praise of Venus, he immediately asserts all of this is false. The earth itself is inanimate, and the gods live far apart from all nature in perfect tranquility. So he states the Epicurean view of the gods. And so these are very interesting passages to show how, you know, what little concession he was making even poetically to these mythological figures. Um, here he teases a little bit of that uh, again, but then takes it away in the context of, of um, demolishing the idea that there is some uh, single element of things. Now, all things contain atoms that have various shapes, and that is why uh, different creatures can be nourished by the same food, 
A single creature consists of many different constituents, a single thing can affect various senses, and so on, because they do have many of the same and thus compatible um, atoms to uh, sort of recognize each other. Everything is not so unique that each individual thing consists of its own kinds of atoms. And atomic recombination into compound bodies can be compared, he says, to the process of recombining the same limited variety of letters in order to form an infinity of different words and sentences, which he says is what he's doing as a poet. He is creating and bringing these verses into being, but they fall into various natural kinds and so forth because he's got a limited variety of letters to start with. He can form an infinite number of combinations um, out of them, but the kinds will tend to recur because the initial letters starting out with are uh, limited in form. And that's interesting and again um, harkens back to a Democritian fragment where Democritus points out that uh, tragedy and comedy are composed out of the very same letters. So the most opposite seeming things and the most things having completely opposite effects on our own emotional states and so forth uh, are caused by the same letters being rearranged in different ways. And similarly, all of the opposite sensible uh, and perceptible phenomena, hot and cold and so forth, that we see are all caused by various recombinations of the same limited number of atomic shapes. And so not every combination is possible. If every combination were possible, we would see many more things that don't fall into natural kinds. We would more commonly see monstrosities and um, chimeras coming to be. But these, of course, are rare and not common, and so not every combination is possible. You have to take into account the intervals, spaces, passages, fastenings, weights, blows, meetings, and movements, how they differ not only in animate things, uh, but also in inanimate things. And so there are just limitations as to how they can interlock and intercombine. Now, the atoms themselves lack all sensible qualities. You can't directly perceive or image an atom. Atoms are colorless. They also lack heat, sound, taste, smell, and so forth. They can't um, emit anything from themselves because they're perfectly hard and solid and indivisible. It's their recombination with other atoms that cause all of these sensible phenomena. That is, the atoms are the causes, not the effects of the various sensible qualities. Now, you need to point out that the atoms themselves are not capable of sensation. They're not living things, so they're not capable of sensation. Living things originate from inanimate materials. And Lucretius gives various kinds of evidence for this. Spontaneous generation, the fact that inanimate food contributes to the sustenance of living things. All this shows that inanimate materials can generate living things. Sensation depends on specific juxtapositions of specific recombinations of atoms. Just chance juxtapositions happening in the background don't produce any sensation. And if atoms were capable of sensation, then they would have to be soft, and they would have to consist of parts, and they would have to consist of uh, void then. And in that case, they would be destructible. And in that case, everything would be destructible. Uh, but it's already been shown that they're indestructible. And so that can't be in the atoms themselves must be incapable of sense. The theory of sensation presented by Lucretius is based on, again, contact or collision and recombination of atomic compounds. The changing juxtapositions and the ways that, that the atoms touch each other and are compounded together cause 
variations of sense. So they themselves can't be subjects of those variations because they are the uh, objective basis of the variations. The causes of the variations of sense are again compared with the recombination of letters to produce different words, sentences, uh, and so on. And we can convey sense and emotion through words and sentences uh, but we don't think that the letters and punctuation marks and so forth experience emotions or sensations. Now, the, we build up to a finale to talk about the infinite um, plurality of worlds, not just infinite swirl of atoms in a big space, but an infinite recombination of atoms into world structures. Um, Lucretius begs Memmius to have an open mind towards this idea which he presents as new and controversial, although it does go back to at least Democritus. It's already been shown, of course, that void or empty space must be infinite or indefinite. That was shown in book one and that there is an infinite number of atoms ever moving through the void, showed in book one and then just repeated in book two. And since there's no limit in any direction, there's no reason to assume that this is the only world that could have come to be. So we can only see our own solar system. Actually, there's one object outside of our solar system we can see, which is, which is another galaxy. But uh, there's no reason to assume that these are the only other um, stars, sun, and moon, or even other galaxies. There's an infinite amount of space out there, so and an infinite number of voids, uh, atoms recombining in void space there. So why shouldn't they form uh, worlds? Since this world, as he says, was also made by nature as the seeds of things of their own accord, jostling from time to time, were driven together in many ways, rashly, idly, and in vain, and at last those united which suddenly cast together might become ever and anon the beginnings of great things, of earth and sky and sea and the race of living things. Wherefore, again and again, you must needs confess that there are here and there other gatherings of matter such as this. So other worlds that form by exactly the same physical processes as ours, other planets that are capable not just of having their own um, land masses and atmospheres, but also other living things. Alien Earths, other solar systems, alien living things, other inhabited worlds, other extraterrestrial intelligences, other even extraterrestrial uh, civilizations. Now, that's a wonderful and interesting phenomenon to contemplate, and he ends, however, by pointing out an implication of that. If our world has come into being just like every other world, then just like every other thing that has come into being, our world, we can presume, will be uh, destroyed, as will every other world, and other later worlds will come to be out of the materials that were destroyed as the atoms ever clash and collide and swerve and recombine in the uh, void. But since our world, we have to accept that our world came to be because of these natural causes and not the gods, we have to accept that our world is subject to decay and destruction by those same natural causes. And we might add by artificial causes of our own design, but all of the temporary phenomena that the combinations of atoms and void that we see will all, just as surely as they came into being, go out of being, and this includes our entire world. It doesn't affect the entire universe, as we already pointed out. That remains a steady state, uh, as it were, because no atom can, no atoms or void 
or anything can be added to it or subtracted from it because of the laws of conservation of matter. And so he ends by saying that our present day Earth already shows signs of this decay and destruction, for example, in the phenomenon of soil erosion. And the book ends with the ancient plowman's reflections on his land's gradual but inevitable decline. Now, recall that in book one, we had these 12 propositions of atomism, the laws of conservation of matter, the proof that atoms and void exist and that there's nothing besides atoms and void, the proofs that the atoms themselves are solid, indestructible, immutable, and indivisible, that the universe is infinite, that there are an infinite supply of bodies in it, and that there are recombinations which give rise to the compound natural bodies that we see. We have added 12 new propositions in this book, which I've here grouped and color-coded, the first three having to do with how the atoms move in void space, the uh, first being that they're in constant motion due to their weight and collisions and redounding with other atoms, that they move through the void at the same speed, all as quickly as possible, and that they must occasionally swerve from their straight paths at undetermined times and places. But the universe as a whole is immovable. Then we have the arguments about the atomic shapes, that there are a great but limited variety of them. There are an infinite supply for each kind of shape, but no visible body consists of only a single element. Everything has a, a lot but a finite amount of variety. And the atoms lack sensible qualities themselves, so they can't be apprehended directly, but they um, are inanimate and are incapable of any kind of sensation. Sensation um, requires complex entities and collisions. Finally, there are a plurality of other worlds, including inhabited worlds with living things that are similar to us, and our world, having come to be through natural causes, is subject to decay and destruction by those natural causes. So those 24 propositions amount to the basic propositions of atomism, and in the subsequent books, we will um, encounter a few more propositions, but then begin to make ethical uh, inferences and ramifications from this physical theory of atomism.